right, so <clears throat> we talked about the three lies. Sex is, is just a physical activity. I can do what I want and still have what God wants, and I've already messed up, so there is no hope for me. Uh, we then got into the seven keys, which is sex is God-designed and God-given. It ought to be God-governed. Number two, there is a sexual difference between men and women. Men are like microwaves. Women are like crockpots. Uh, number three, you must have a heart of a servant. And then number four is be as creative as you want. Number five, guard your sex life and intimacy. Guard your sex life and intimacy. If you go to Proverbs 5, let's go to the first verse. Proverbs 5, 1. <clears throat> this is advice from a father to a son. And this is David, who happens to know quite a bit about what he's telling Solomon. And he says, My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Turn your ear to my words of insight, that you maintain, may maintain discretion, and that your lips may preserve knowledge. For the lips of the adulterous woman drip like honey, and her speech is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is as bitter as gall, sharp as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lead straight to the grave. She gives no thought to the way of life. Her paths wander aimlessly, and she does not know it. Now then, my sons, listen to me. Do not turn aside from what I say. Keep to a path far from her. Do not go near the door of her house, lest you lose your honors to other and your dignity to one who is cruel. Lest strangers feast on your wealth and your toil enrich the house of another. At the end of your life, you will groan when your flesh and your body are spent. Now, look at, look at how, <laughs> isn't it something how this is David's advice? to Solomon and he's telling him <clears throat> stay away from her door in other words don't even be curious about the strangeness of things that are outside of your relationships he said because her words drip like honey and she knows exactly what to say he knows exactly what to say to you he knows exactly what it is that you need to hear you know, a lot of times when people are struggling in their own relationship and then they go to work and then somebody at work, whether it be a, a female in terms of a man or a male in terms of a woman, they know exactly what to say to you. And they don't even know they're on assignment because it says she doesn't even know what she's doing, but she has no boundaries. And he said, stay away from her door. Don't even come anywhere near her because it's easier to avoid than it is to resist. And sometimes we're not careful. Uh, you know, I've had people that have come for counseling and they're like, well, uh, Pastor, I haven't had sex with this person. I just talked to this person. You know, the reality is that relationships that form out of intimacy don't always include sex. And ones where those boundaries are crossed intimately are worse than the ones that are just a purely sexual thing. Because when you start going by the door, you start hanging out with that person, you start going to lunch with that person, uh, you know, it's easier to avoid uh, than it is to resist. And so it's extremely important that you guard that. And notice what he tells him. He says, or else strangers will feast on your wealth. Mm -hmm. What happens when divorce happens? Yeah. Strangers feast on your wealth. And, and notice something else. In verse 11, <clears throat> It says, at the end of your life you will groan, and when your flesh and body are spent. The NLT says it this way. We know this, that the end result of sexual promiscuity is, is sickness and disease. Right? Well, notice what it says. In the end, you will groan in anguish when disease consumes your body. Amen. David is telling him this and trying to help him to, uh, you know, to avoid some of the pitfalls that obviously David found himself in. Verse 12, you will say how I hated dis discipline, how my heart spumed correction. I would not obey my teachers and turn my ear to my instructors, and I was soon in serious trouble in the assembly of God's people. Drink water from your own cistern, running water from your own well. Should your springs overflow into the streets, your streams of water in public squares, 
Let them be yours alone, never to be shared with strangers. May your fountains be blessed, and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. A loving doe, a graceful deer, may her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. Why, my son, be intoxicated with another man's wife? Why embrace the bosom of a wayward woman? For your ways are in full view of the Lord, and he examines all your past. The evil deeds of the wicked ensnare them, and the cords of their sins hold them fast. For a lack of discipline, they will die, led astray by their own great folly. Notice he says to drink from your own cistern, and then he says, and not from someone else's well. Cistern is a covered vessel. Wells are not. Wells are open. Cisterns aren't. And he's trying to give the imagery and the understanding that if it is yours, it is to be enjoyed by you. And he says, rejoice in the wife of your youth. You know, the one you married. The woman that you, at one point in time, whether it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, however long it was, you married her. And if she's crazy, you married her. <laughs> which makes you crazy. Yeah. <laughs> no, people that, oh, I, I just didn't know. Yes, you did. He's just this, that, and the third. Yes, but you married this, that, and the third. And you married him in all his craziness, but here's the truth of the matter is, you were infatuated. They say the stage of infatuation for a beginning of a relationship is equal to the level of dopamine that, that cocaine sends to your brain. So what does that mean? You was high. <laughs> he could do no wrong. She could do no wrong. She was the greatest thing since sliced bread. All them little cute idiosyncrasies that you thought were so cute after five years of putting up with it, now it's irritating you. Right? And it ain't them, it's you. And, and there's, listen, you're rubbing the cat the wrong way, you got two options. You rub the cat the right way or you turn the cat around. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and, and so this is where he's telling him, he's saying, let her breast always satisfy you. Be intoxicated with her love. Listen, if you are drunk with her love, you don't have time for nobody else. Right. You're like, look, child, bye. Ain't nobody got time for you. I'm intoxicated or I'm drunk with her. And vice versa, she's drunk with him. And notice how he says there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with lusting after your wife or your husband. Yeah. They're your wife or your husband. They're bone of your bone, flesh of your flesh. Nothing wrong with that. But when it's in its proper context, he's trying to tell him, beware of people who will speak into your ear. Because some people know exactly what to say. You're not getting any compliments from your husband, and you go to work, and he's telling you how beautiful you are. And, oh, if you were my wife, I'd treat you differently. Well, I'm not your wife. And don't bring it up again. Are, are, you, are you seeing what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh, if you were my husband, I, I would just treat you like royalty. Well, that's why you ain't got no husband. Yeah. Are, are y'all with me? Yeah. And, and this is important because so many people don't recognize that they know exactly what words to say. Yeah. And this is the thing that kind of uh, shocked me was the reality of it's an assignment. And you got to be smart enough to see it coming. Yeah. Because, you know, fellas, if I could just be honest with y'all, we, we could be a little dopey sometimes. Mm -hmm. And this is why for my wife, if she tells me watch out for somebody, I watch out for them. Mm -hmm. I'm done. You want to know why? Because she knows. Yeah. And in the same token, in the same vein, if I see a guy talking to her a certain way, I'll be like, watch out for him. Mm -hmm. Why? Because I know. If you don't have a wife you can trust, you got a problem. Because I guarantee you, she knows exactly who's trying to pick up on her man and who ain't. And you're like, well, she's just being jealous. No, she's got intuition. And you're being dopey. Because you like the attention. <clears throat> you notice that Abraham... Um, yeah, Abraham. You notice when God told him that Isaac was his firstborn. And Sarai, his wife, came up with the idea of sleeping with the maid, 
with her maidservant, right? And God had already told him where this child was going to come from. And they figured they was going to help God out. So he slept with her handmaiden, and they bore a child. And we're still wrestling with that child today. That was Ishmael, right? Okay. Do you notice how when God told him to send her, she said, we're going to send her away. Do you know what Abraham's reaction was when God told him to send her away? He was mad. He was mad. Now, God promised him a child through his own wife, yet he's salty when God said, send that other one away. See, he's connected in a way that was way unhealthy. It should have never happened in the first place. But what I'm trying to help you to recognize is when you have proper boundaries, you don't see it until it catches you. That's why I said the trap is set. You are ensnared by the cords of your own sin. And people have no idea how dangerous it is to allow these things to happen. If you want sexual fulfillment in a relationship, you've got to protect that relationship with everything you have. Because they will come at you all kinds of ways. And, and people have seen my wife with her wedding ring on and said all kinds of things when I'm not around. Notice, when I'm not around. Because I might be holy, but I got a hint of hood in me. And so, you know, it, it's interesting that the temptress always comes, and you have to always be on guard, amen? All right, number six, <clears throat> make it a priority. Make it a priority. Don't downplay the importance of, of a fulfilling sex life. There's certain people, they'll be like, you know, well, I just appreciate all the non-sex we're having. Or I just appreciate the fact that we're together. And he needs to want me for more than just sex. I mean, you know, people say all kinds of stuff. And the reality is that I am certain that everyone will want their wife or their husband for more than just sex. But that doesn't mean we throw the baby out with the bathwater. It doesn't mean that we downplay the importance of it. Look at uh, Deuteronomy 24 verse 5 in the very beginning God said there shall be uh, there shall man leave a father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife right we already read that in Genesis so the first thing God says is you're supposed to leave your mother and father and, and cling to or cleave to or be intimate with your wife right God set that from the very beginning but I want you to watch uh, Deuteronomy 24 verse 5 do y'all put scriptures on the screen Deuteronomy 24, verse 5. When a man hath taken a new wife, he shall not go to war, neither shall he be charged with any business, but he shall be free at home one year and shall cheer up his wife, which he has taken. God said, <clears throat> don't give him a job, don't give him any business, don't, give, don't send him to war, if he gets married, he is responsible to stay at home and cheer up his wife. <laughs> That's his job, to make her toes curl. That's his job. God gave it a priority. Why don't you? He put it over industry. He put it over war. He said, you take care of her and let her take care of you, and that's the priority. But yet and still people say, well, it's not that big of a deal. They downplay it, da, da, da. That's a problem. Because the reality is you have to make it a priority, and then you have to understand that your kids don't come before your spouse. And, and it, the creation never comes before the creator. So you don't let your kids run you ragged with they got to be at this practice and this practice and this practice. And next thing you know, your whole schedule is consumed with things and you begin to ignore your spouse. Same thing with fellas. Work is not more important than your home. Ministry is not important. My first ministry is to God. My second ministry is to my wife. My third one is to my family and the fourth one is to the church. In that order. 
And so for, for us to understand, we have to recognize it's a priority to God, and we need to make that uh, a priority in our own lives. Because if you don't make it a priority, it'll never get done. We have a saying, we have a saying in our office that uh, whatever doesn't get calendar doesn't get done. If it ain't on the calendar, it, don't, it just don't happen. These things should be a priority for you and make it important and invest the time accordingly. Amen? Amen. Okay. <coughs> Number seven. Number seven. Create an atmosphere for sexual pleasure. Create an atmosphere for sexual pleasure. Number one, take care of your health and your hygiene. That's so important. How you present yourself, how you handle yourself. Listen, fellas, there's nothing appealing about that T-shirt that you seem to wear that's your favorite shirt that smells like who done it and to who <laughs> that you use to change the oil. There's nothing cute about that for her. And, and so you can't, you know, you need to splash some water on it. Use the little whatever you got in your gift bag. Put, put, some, put some smell good on it. Dab a little spit behind your ears. I mean, this is important, y'all. Create that atmosphere for that. Listen, ladies, do the same thing. Understand that he doesn't want to come home and see you looking ragged. Jump in the shower before he comes home. Put a little bit of this, that, and the other. And then don't put nothing else on but one of his ties. And wait, and look, I'm serious. And just walk on by. As soon as he comes through the door, just walk right by him. I don't care how tired he is, he's going to be like, whoa, man. It's important how you handle these things to create that atmosphere. You know, it, it, it's, maybe you do have a, a robe that you love and it's your favorite robe. Get yourself a seamstress and have her hem that puppy just about three inches below the top of your back. So that when you walk by, you just go like this. Boom. Got his attention. Create an atmosphere for that. Ain't nothing wrong with that. You, this is your house. This is your husband. Are you, are you feeling me? Fellas, look, jump in the shower. Stop sitting on the couch scratching, thinking she's going to like that. Let me help y'all out. If you scratching, <laughs> there is likely a need <laughs> for some type of hygiene. Oh, dear God. You got to realize these things. And, and as you get older, things change. Now I don't want my words to trip me up. But hormones change, things change. Things ain't always in the spot where they started out. I mean, just, that's just the way things go. So you got to make sure, you know, medications getting involved and medications will affect you in a bad way. You have to be uh, cognizant of that and recognize how these things affect you. Realizing, you know, the way you dress, the, the, the music you, you listen to. I mean, I, I love, you know, wor praise and worship, but praise and worship music is not it when it's time. I mean, I just... I, I don't I don't know about y'all, but if you listen, <laughs> understand the mood, understand the the environment. You know, it, how many y'all know who Teddy Pendergrass is? Yeah. Okay. You don't know what to do. Get yourself a Teddy Pendergrass CD. <laughs> he'll tell you. You just listen long enough, he'll tell you. He'll be like, turn off the lights. Let's light a candle. If you don't know what to do, he will step you through the whole process. <laughs> See, your health is important. Your stamina is important. I mean, you know, you, you got to... <laughs> you got to recognize that, you're, that, you know, if she's a crock pot, you're going to have to be committed for the long haul. And it can't just be about you. You got to be about her. 
Are you understand what I'm saying? And she needs to be, they, they said something like, I think it's like 20 to 30 percent of all intimate encounters with a man that a woman actually, that a man stays around long enough for a woman to have a climax. They said 70 percent of the time, he's just about himself. A selfishness. That don't even make any sense. How, now, now, ask yourself a question. Why would she be jumping all aboard on that? If that's what that's going to be for her. So you got to have stamina. You got to have the ability to understand things. And listen, ladies, please. If you don't think he knows what's going on, well, let me say it this way. <laughs> <laughs> Fellas, because I've heard I've, men have said, oh my gosh, she takes so long. And I'm like, it's because you're not doing it right. <laughs> ladies, break out a diagram. Draw him a picture. I ain't kidding. Say, this is this, this is this. Spend all your time right here. <laughs> Help him. Every, every, every man wants to please his wife. Every one of them. I don't think there's a man alive that, that doesn't want to please his wife. But it requires some level of sacrifice. It requires you taking care of yourself. And ladies, the same thing. If, he, if he's asking what's his name and it takes you five minutes to tell him because you're out of breath, <laughs> there's some things you need to work on. This is a physical activity. <laughs> you over here needing a respirator. <clears throat> if you begin to recognize that is part of your responsibility to create that atmosphere, then you begin to learn that there are ways. Every person is like a lock. They have a combination. Remember the old school uh, locks with the combo on them? Or if you had a gym locker, you know, a school locker back in the day or whatever, and it's 32 right and 42 left and whatever, right? Everybody has a combination. Everybody. Every woman, every man has a combination. It is your job in the covenant of marriage to find out what that is. And once you know the combination, you, you can unlock every single time. But you have to be interested enough to create an atmosphere for that. This is why, you know, it, it's funny how I have a couple that's uh, getting ready to get married. And um, they are both virgins which is, I, I would have to probably say this is my first that I know of marriage that I've done, wedding that I've done, that both of them were virgins, which is great. One of the questions they asked me was, how do we know if we're doing it right? I'm like, it don't matter. Ain't neither one of y'all done did it before. Right. <laughs> what do you think the marriage is for? It's to explore those things and to figure that out together. Do you understand how much of an of a, uh, advantage they have? Because they have nothing to compare with. Because as quiet as this kept, nobody wants to talk about it, but the truth of the matter is, everybody compares. Whether they do it vocally or mentally, there's a comparison going on. And that's not healthy. So we have to understand that, that in the confines of marriage, Maybe you try some things and this ain't good. I don't like it. You don't like it. Let's not ever do that again. Chalk it off to a bad experience. Keep it moving. But the beautiful thing about sex is sex is like jello. There's always room for jello. It's like, you know, sorry, well, how much is too much? What, what kind of question is that? That's like saying you have too much money. If we create an environment for it, if we, are, if we understand, Let, look at Ephesians real quick. Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, verse 22. Let me give you all a quick hermeneutics class. You ready? <clears throat> 
because I've heard people say, based on this scripture, that um, that women can't pastor. About the stupidest thing you ever did here. But let me let me give you a hermeneutics class real quick. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Now notice what it says. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband, <laughs> not everybody else's husband. I've heard this before. And it's like, wait a minute. You just took out your own and said that men are the head and they, no, no, in the household, domestically, the man is the head of his home. But a woman can pastor just as well and preach the paint off the walls just as well as anybody else can. And she is not submitted to you. She's submitted to her own husband. Right? And this verse 24 says, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, notice what it says here. Here's what I want you to see. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he may sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the, that he may present it to himself, a glorious church, having spot, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Is the bride of Christ, the church, is the church without blemish? Yes or no? <laughs> I'm glad you hesitated. Because technically, the church is without blemish. But yet, the church is blemished and flawed. And he's saying in the same way, husbands love your wives, then you are to love her like Christ loved the church. And what makes her right in your eyes is what you say about her and over her and to her. And when you don't say and speak and call the right things over her, then you are presenting her with blemish. And then when you find all these blemishes and faults in her and you say it's her, it's really That's why I said, no men, so ought men love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man have ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherished it even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause, notice what he brought in here. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverences or honors her husband. <clears throat> he didn't tell men to love their wives. And he didn't tell, or he told men to love their wives. He didn't tell them to honor his wife. And he didn't tell wives to love your husband. He said to honor your husband. Now, love and honor are included in those, but I want you to understand what got brought to the surface. Because men interpret love through honor. And women interpret honor through love. And so if you don't honor him, if he gets no respect, if when he comes home he can't get the big piece of chicken, <laughs> see, because you want to say things to him. Baby, I love you. You're so this, you're so that. He doesn't hear that. It means absolutely nothing to him for you to tell him you love him. But when you honor him and you show him that, when you are his cheerleader, when you are the one who's got his back, you are the one who will rub on his back and, and scratch his back and, and rub his feet and whatever else, he sees those acts as honor. And now he knows she really cares. Because in his mind, when he comes home from work and he supplies for the family, he's showing you that he loves you. And he almost finds it borderline nagging for you to make him say it. But he's wrong because he needs to show it and say it. Just in the same way, ladies, you need to say it and 
See, that's how God set this thing up. And so men respond to honor. You, you want, listen, you ever notice that you will see a man who <clears throat> maybe he's a professional, but all of a sudden he leaves his wife for some girl at the job. And you see his wife, and his wife is pretty good looking. And the girl at the job looks like you got to tie a pork chop around her neck to get the dog to play with her. <laughs> and you're wondering, how in the world did that happen? Come on, let's kill. Yeah. Right? I mean, she's so ugly, her tears roll down the back of her head. And you're like, what in the world? Where did this happen? What do you think that is? That comes from she honors him. She makes him feel like he hung the moon. He does something at work. She's like, you're so smart and brilliant. And then he gets home, and all he gets is a honeydew list. You didn't finish this. You didn't do this. You didn't do this right. When are you going to get around to doing this? And he goes back to work, and she's talking about how intelligent he is and how handsome he is and how gifted he is. And all of a sudden, he overlooks all of the other things. Do you see what I'm trying to, y'all picking up what I'm throwing down? So it's important for us to understand that as you are setting uh, this atmosphere and you're understanding each other and you're communicating in the language that each other has, some people value acts of service. Some people value words of affirmation. There are many different things that people enjoy. It is your job to figure out what that is and deal with them from that context and be intentional about it. Listen, if you got to make a little spreadsheet or write yourself a little note and check a box every time you do it every day, just be intentional. There's nothing wrong with that because after a while, it'll become a habit. And when it becomes a habit, you'll see fulfillment go through the roof. When she thinks you value her all day long for everything that she does, she has no problem being Martha Stewart in the kitchen and Madonna in the bedroom. <laughs> but it's when resentment begins to build, there's no appreciation, there's no words of affirmation, there's no conversation, there's just, let's just do this, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, and I really appreciate you doing that for me. Oh, no problem. Y'all see what I'm trying to... Th so we have to recognize that and, and make it purposeful in how we handle these things. Okay, so that was seven. Remember I told you seven keys, right? Well, I'm an overachiever, so here's number eight. A baker's dozen for you. Number eight is communicate honestly and openly. Honestly and openly. Now, remember, y'all, you want to be equally yoked, right? And so if there are things that you like, things that you want out of intimacy, you need to talk about them. Uh, pastor was just telling me that, um, you know, sometimes people are very uncomfortable talking about certain things when they're doing premarital counseling. And, and we were just agreeing because I have the same problem. Whatever they don't want to talk about, I assure you he's going to bite him later. Because it's, it's usually, you, you ever notice how a dog will guard his wounds? That's how people are. They'll guard their wounds. And so whatever they don't want to talk about, that's the very thing we need to talk about. And so when we are in those type of spiritual guidance counseling sessions, if I find there's something they're, they're real protective of, I go after like a puppy or a chew toy. Because, listen, if we're going to fight, we're going to fight now. We're going to get this out of the way. We're going to get this done early. And the realities are that you got to be equally yoked. And so conversations have to happen. They're absolutely necessary. And if you've got things in your little bag of tricks that you like, you better talk to her about it before y'all get too far down this road. And she should be talking to you about it. I like this. I don't like this. I ain't doing this. I'll do that. I love this. I enjoy this. I don't enjoy that. These are conversations that absolutely need to be had. And they've got to be at a place where if you feel bashful and uh, uncomfortable having these conversations, you're not ready. Because you're going to spend the rest of your life with somebody that you can't talk about intimate things with. 
uh, so you have to recognize that these are the things that uh, need to be done. And, and ladies, listen, in your communication, you know, you can't just tell him, stop that, don't do that, ouch, that hurts, I don't like that. Start telling him the things you do like. Because sometimes we can get predisposed uh, to things we don't like, and that's all we hear is the communication of what you don't like. We want to hear what do you like. So we can start making a list of the things that we actually can do that you enjoy. Because we don't read minds. Despite what you may want us to do, we don't. And I, and, I'm, and I assure you, if you leave a man to his own interpretation, it's going to be a problem. That's why God said it's not good for a man to be alone. And he was not talking about mankind because mankind hadn't been fully developed yet. He was talking about it's not good for a man to be alone to his own devices. So if you want him to know, you have to tell him. Like I told you earlier, get, get a diagram. Bust out a book. Say, look, this is, this is how this works. Help him to become better. Show him what you like. And same thing, husbands. Show your wife what it is that you like. People usually want to please each other. They want to win. But when the experience becomes very negative, usually they just start developing a repressive attitude. And once that happens, it'll kill the relationship. And listen, if, if there's times where you have sexual problems or intimacy issues, I mean, there's so many things uh, that can happen from uh, erectile dysfunctions to just incompatibilities to issues. You know, there's a lot of things that can happen in a relationship. Find solutions together. Make it a point together to sit down and say, let's do some research together. Let's figure out some things. There are so many things out there that will help. If, he, if he's not a person who can last, then there are things out. There's creams, there's, there's uh, rings, there's all kinds of stuff. There's pumps, there's all kinds of things that will help you in your sex life. People have been having sex for a long, long time. There are a lot of options available to us. Don't let it kill your relationship because you don't want to talk about it. It might, it might be, how do I say it? It might be difficult to discuss, but it's still an elephant and it's got to go. Because every elephant has got to leave. That's the whole point of the elephant in the bedroom. It's not to keep it there, it's to get rid of it. <clears throat> and so if things are uncomfortable for her, there are things you can do for that. As, as sometimes as women age, you know, they need loops, they need things of that nature. Listen, do and try and work on it together. You just might find some things you like. And you might find some things you don't like. But at minimum, you're doing it on the journey together. A lot of times, husbands and wives don't want to talk about this stuff. And they'll harbor it and they'll hold it instead of just saying, listen, let's find a solution together. And letting there be joy and fulfillment in the process of exploring these things as a team. And you just never know the things you might uh, come up with. But you have to take the time and make it uh, uh, purposeful in your marriage to say, I want to figure this out with you. I want to work through this with you. Because life will throw curveballs at you. Life will be full of ups and downs. If, if you've been married long enough, you will learn that there will always be seasons. And how long those seasons are, nobody knows. But the realities are, that those that are committed will endure the storm. Those that are wrapped up in their feelings and their emotions tend not to because they're always looking for chemistry. And if chemistry doesn't you know, show up, then, well, maybe it's time to move on. No, it's not time to move on. It's time to have a conversation. It's time to get real about the things that you may struggle with or the problems you may have. It's time to get real about what you need. And as a wife, if you have needs that he's not meeting, it's time to use those dreaded words. We need to talk. And husbands, the same thing. If you're having needs that she's not meeting, it's time to have those conversations. And as difficult as they are, they're liberating. They're very liberating because Satan loves things to be kept in secret. He just loves it. He hates when sunlight hits. And I don't mean S-U-N, I mean S-O-N. 
He wants to, God wants the sunlight to be on these things so he can heal them and he can fix them. And if you purpose in your hearts to realize that all of you that are married in this room, if you ain't married, just put everything I just said on hold. Put it in the back of your mind and know this is how it should be. But if you're married, you should purpose to say whatever it is that you're doing now, if it's one time a week, one time a year, I don't know, whatever it is, <laughs> double it up, step it up. And see what happens. Watch the intimacy grow. Watch the connection get deeper. Watch how your thoughts will change. It's really, really important, I'm telling you. And this is one of the weapons that have been waged against the church far, far too long. We need to be very careful how we handle this. I got one more place I want to take you to. Ezekiel 16. Verse 8. Ezekiel 16, verse 8. What translation do you guys have? I didn't write what translation this is. You guys can put anything up there you have, but I'll read it to you out of my translation uh, that I put here. It says, when I saw you again, you were old enough to have sex. So I covered your naked body with my robe. Then I solemnly promised that you would belong to me and that I, the Lord God, would take care of you. This is God speaking to the children of Israel. And he used this reference of intimacy and covenant. And he said, you were old enough to have sex, so I covered your naked body with my robe, or I covered you with my skirt. God himself used this very imagery to articulate his relationship and his desire towards the children of Israel. How could sex be perverted? And he used such an inference to reference his children. It is one of the most intimate expressions that is between a man and his wife and between a woman and her husband. It is likened unto God. And it is his desire to have that level of covenant in every Christian marriage. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine what it would be like if every Christian marriage thought like that? He said, it's letting you know that I would take care of you. It's not just about sex. It's about the expression that I will take care of you. That you are my covenant partner. That everything you are, everything you will ever be, I want to be a part of that. I want the intimacy and the connection and the closeness. It is not just passe. It is not just, well, you know, if we get around to it, we get around to it. But it's important. And it's of high value to God. And this is why all you single folks, quit giving away what you should not be giving away you should be awarding to someone who is worthy, who comes with the responsibility that they're going to take care of you. And if they want it, then they better put a ring on it. Simple. And, and, and you know, I've, I've heard people, well, he gave me a promise ring. Listen, he gives you a promise ring, you give him a promise plate. You, you know what I'm talking about, right? On the plate, you write, I promise to cook you dinner when we're married. Here's my promise. Too many people don't value the intimacy between a husband and his wife. They don't realize that God used that as his own inference to say, this is how I feel about you. That I'll spread my skirt and take you in and let you know I'll take care of you. 
It's way deeper than people realize. And we have to make a commitment to that. We have to make a, a, a purposeful effort because it's not easy. It doesn't come naturally. The act can come naturally. But all that surrounds it, it doesn't come easy. You've got to work at it. You've got a desire for it. You've got to put the time in. And watch what God will do. Watch how he'll strengthen the relationship. Watch how he'll build you deeper and deeper into each other to the point where you, you wonder why he doesn't look at you the same way anymore. You wonder why she doesn't look at you the same way anymore. It's because it's not there. They don't feel that taken care of. They don't feel the intimacy and that connection. They feel like you're distracted from one thing or the next. If we are able as believers to bring our marriages back to that place, can you imagine what the world would see? Because the message we're sending now, the world doesn't want it. But when the, wor <clears throat> when the world sees the real gift, when they see the true, they'll know. They'll know. It's funny how when people say, uh, like I remember when I first started going to church, and the church I went to, um, you know, we're, we're charismatic. We'll run, we'll shout, we'll dance. And I love those type of messages, and I love those type of meetings. But I remember when I would bring people to church, I would say, Lord, don't do nothing crazy. <laughs> These people don't know anything. Don't scare them. Don't do nothing crazy. Cause you, don't, you, know what, you know what I've learned over the years? I was young and didn't understand. You know what I learned over the years? If it's genuine, people know. They really do. They can discern it instantly, and they know. I've seen people who've never seen any of this stuff. I was preaching a message one time at a Methodist church. And uh, this lady got healed, and all of a sudden, healing started popping off all over the place. And I remember seeing this older lady, and she's looking at me, and she's scowling at me the whole time. I'm thinking to myself, what, lady? Bring it. <laughs> Ain't nothing between us but air and opportunity. Come on. But she was scowling at me the entire time. So all kinds of stuff's breaking off, healings, all kinds of things are happening. And then uh, after the service is over, she walks up to me, and I was trying to avoid her. She walks up to me and says, can I talk to you? I said, oh, God, here we go. I said, yes, ma'am. She goes, my grandparents started this church in 1906. She said, and they used to tell me stories about stuff like this. She said, and I'd never seen it until now. Mm -hmm. I was like, Because <laughs> I thought she was going to go in. I was like, y'all, I cannot be on the news for beating up this old lady. <laughs> I just can't. I just can't. That's just not a good look for a pastor, right? So I'm like, she said, yeah, she goes, my, she goes and, and a lot of people don't know this, but originally Methodists were very charismatic. And uh, certainly there's many that have gotten away from that, but the point I'm trying to get at is you don't know what people are thinking, going through, or dealing with. But when the real shows up, it'll hit them right in their hearts. And what I'm trying to get you to understand is God desires for you to go deeper. And if you are in covenant and married, there is no other relationship higher than that covenant. And God likens that relationship to his. And if he values it enough to tell you, I won't even get in the middle of that without consent, then it must be important. It must be significant. And I love how your, your, your pastor said to me, um, he said, we're bold about everything else. We're bold about healing. We're bold about prosperity. We're bold about the Holy Ghost. He said, we ought to be bold about this too. Because how many broken relationships are out there? How many people are struggling with sexuality? How many people are are just hurting over being in one bad relationship after the next and leading with sex and they have no understanding and the world is hurting. And we're sitting by and large as the church answering questions that nobody is asking. 
all the while the world is in pain. And we have the answer. How much do you have to hate people to not share that? So they need to look at us. They need to see us. They need to see us walking around holding hands and, and staring at each other and undressing each other, your own wife and your own <laughs> husband, <laughs> with your eyes and, and being desiring towards them. They need to see that because that's the education they need. They do more by what they see you do than what you say. And the truth of the matter is, in this world, you might just be the only Bible that people get to read. So what are you saying? Amen? Amen. Love you guys. Amen. Sir. Hallelujah. Good stuff. Yes. Amen. Amen. And, uh, you know, this is very applicable in in all areas. I mean, if we want intimacy with God, we pursue it the same way. And uh, in in other relationships, I mean, it's not always going to, you know, it's not going to end in, in in sex. However, there's a lot of applicable. I mean, there was a lot of points made tonight, uh, uh, you know, that reference in you know intimacy. However. There's a lot of principles that carry over into, you know, multiple areas. And so um, I, I just want to make sure that those of you that, you know, are here that aren't married, that you're not, you know, well, I'm just sitting here wasting time. You know, there's talking about sex. No, there's principles. Amen. And, um, and, you know, we got to get a hold of the principles. Because uh, if we don't know the principles, we'll never be able to put into action Amen. what we know and so praise God well, I want to give you an opportunity to sow tonight uh, praise God um, everything that comes in in this offering tonight will go to uh, Pastor Gene um, if you didn't come prepared tonight to do anything we also receive offerings tomorrow uh, during our session uh, then again Sunday morning uh, so you'll have three opportunities uh, to give, amen, and uh, hallelujah, that means uh, triple up, hallelujah, amen, um, so if you're writing a check, you can go ahead and make it out to Living Word Family Church, we'll write them one check at the end of, of the weekend uh, to just bless them and, and appreciate them for coming and investing, because uh, I, I guarantee you, um, this is a very small minority uh, of the big picture of what's happening in the body of Christ when it comes to relationships. Um, you know, we had a conversation. He went um, somewhere, and, and again, you know, he can only go and, and do what he's allowed to do because um, he submits to the to the person in charge. And uh, and and so, you know, he was brought similar presentation and the pastor says please scale it back well I was like when he asked me that question I was like don't scale nothing back um, we, we, we want it uh, we want all that God has because um, if we don't get all that God has on this topic there are going to be things that we miss um, and uh the best term I know how to use, if we miss all of the big things, we'll live our life handicapped um, in, in these areas. And, and I tell you what, people struggle all the time in relationship. And, and it doesn't matter whether it's husband, wife. Um, we can go all the way back to, you know, father, uh, son, mother, daughter, vice versa. Um, and then just in our everyday life, sometimes we struggle, you know, having a relationship with our boss um, and uh, or just a neighbor. And so um, it's really important um, that uh, we don't hold anything back. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, um, if you would, ushers, go ahead and allow the people to give um, tomorrow morning. Uh, we're going to start promptly at 10, 
and it'll be about the same format. Um, tomorrow morning, we'll go, uh, we'll get started right at 10. Um, we'll go about 45 minutes, and then we'll have some coffee and some refreshments, and then uh, we'll pick back up uh, again at about 11.15, go right up to noon, and then uh, we'll dismiss you to enjoy your, your afternoon, and, uh, and then we'll be back Sunday morning uh, for the, uh, uh, the Sunday morning portion of this. Uh, we did uh, change our family Sunday, so it's, it's full blast on Sunday morning as well. Uh, the kids will be back in Children's Church. Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, we'll wrap up Friday evening at 5.30 with the banquet. And uh, so we're just uh, so blessed to, to have access to this information. And uh, so we appreciate you all coming out tonight. Hallelujah. Let me pray over you. Praise God if you want to stand. Hallelujah. We'll bless the offering and then we'll bless you. Hallelujah. Father, we just thank you for this opportunity that we have, Lord, to be a blessing, to sow seed. And Father, we just thank, thank you that you, this Father. seed will thank be a you. blessing and an encouragement and a help. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For the Herndons to go thank and do you, all Father. that you've called them to do. Thank to continue you, to spread the message of the gospel of the kingdom. Yes. Thank and Father, you, we just thank you that we are recipients this weekend. Thank and you, Father, Jesus. we don't take lightly our responsibility to receive the engrafted Hallelujah. word. Hallelujah. So that it saves, thank you, changes, rearranges thank you, our Jesus. soul so that we live differently, we act differently, we relate differently to others. Amen. And so, Father, we thank, thank you, you Father. for this opportunity to give and, and share. Yes. Hallelujah. And, Father, we just thank you. Thank that as we go our separate ways tonight, that you just continue to guide, guard, protect, and keep us, that your angels have charge over us in all of our ways. And we just give you thanks and praise for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, love you. Appreciate you. Look forward to seeing you back tomorrow morning at 10.